Well, the Six Nations isn't the only big topic to discuss this week as we continue to hear rumours about whether or not the Lions tour will go ahead. So apparently the four home nations captains were on a conference call this week with the senior management pushing for the tour to go ahead. So I suppose we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. But on a more positive note, there's also been rumours building over the last two weeks about a potential Lions 15 and a Sanzar 15. So that would compromise um, of the best players from the rugby championship. So Jamie, first of all, do you think that it would work as a one-off series if the Lions tour wasn't going ahead? No. Uh, Why? I don't know. I'd, I'd, if there was going to be another team that is a collective as as countries, I'd like to see a Pacific Islands side come together. Um, I think the Australia, New Zealand and um, South Africa are so far apart geographically and as identities as rugby countries. I think a team comprising those countries doesn't work for me. Um, the Lions is what it is because they're, they're part of the United Kingdom. Um, as such, I say Ireland. Ireland isn't, mm. but it's British and Irish Lions concept. I'd like to see the Pacific Islands have something um, where they come together and have a touring team like the Lions. Sansa, no, I don't like the idea. If you had to put a team together, who would you know? Who would make your team? So Ryan, I'll start with you. Start with Jamie. I was going to give Jamie a minute to calm down. Okay, so. start with me. Um, I would basically pick the whole of the New Zealand team. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And then I would chuck in maybe Cheslin Colby, uh, Khaleesi. I'd have him in there. And maybe some giant second row. Who I mean, it's it, Beth. What's the other one? The one that looks like Hagrid. That no, plays yeah. for South Africa. Like just a massive mutant second row because Kiwis don't really have giant second rows, do they? So, yeah, just one of those big boys from South Africa, whoever they are. That would be that would pretty much be my team. And then get Rens to coach it. Dave Rennie, Australia coach, and there's a coach him. done. What about you, Jamie? Who would make your I mean, team? It's hard to it's hard to disagree with. Um... Something you agree oh, on? The Springbok pack, I'd have kits off. I would have Khaleesi, Steph de Toit, and probably, you know, those three in amongst a predominantly all black pack. Um, yeah, maybe one of the second rows as well. It needs the, it needs the muscle of the South African pack. Um, and then, yeah, backs. Colby's got to be in there. Blokes, an immense player. Yeah. Um, Kiwi half backs. Maybe a few of the Aussies sprinkled in there, but a mix in the back line, I think. I think across those three countries have some special, special backs. So, I mean, it'll be a freakish side. There's no doubt about that. But whether we'll ever see it happen, God knows. Well, we just have to start thinking of things, don't we? We just have to get creative this year. Well, I'd actually love for our listeners to get involved with this and to send us our, their, their version of a starting 15. But actually, we're also going to run a competition. So I'm not sure if our listeners know this, but we actually have some pretty cool Rugby Pass merchandise available. So how about we put it to our listeners to give it their best shot at designing a concept Sansar kit that inc- or incorporates all the country's values. And they have to post their entry on Twitter with the hashtag offload kit and the best one will get some Rugby Pass merch. That's a fabulous idea. So wonderful. I love how I just came up with it on the spot. I know, incredible. It's just so great. James Botham obviously never heard the expression two ears, one mouth before because um, he spoke over Alan Wynne Jones at a training session back in autumn. Jamie, have you ever experienced the Alan Wynne death stare before? Uh, I don't think so. Not too often. Um, I can see where James is coming from with that comment. You know, he's a confident lad, you know, backs his ability. I love that. I love that about younger players who come in. Um, but I guess there's a time and a place <laughs> for skippers talking. Uh, that exuberance of youth sometimes gets the better of you. Uh, I've probably been that kid um, when I was younger and probably annoyed people no end with the amount I wanted to speak. Um, but there's a time and a place. And you learn. You know, you learn. Obviously, he's come out and spoken about that. You know, that happens in lots of environments across the country quite often. Um, and that, that go unspoken about. Uh, but you learn. You learn when to when to speak. But I, look, I love young young players coming into the game um, and having opinions and bringing energy or whatever. But I think you you slowly learn your place as a young player. Um, sorry, you quickly learn your place as a young player. You know when when to open your mouth and when to just listen. Um, and I guess you know when the when the big man when the big man is talking, he's someone you don't cut across. 
Yeah, I'd say you'd want to die. I'd say you'd want the world to swallow you up now. Um, Because obviously just wasn't listening. But Ryan, do you have any stories of young players that you've seen come into squads and make comments or do something that they very quickly regretted? Um, I mean, you always get these guys that come in and think they've cracked it already. And they're the ones that drive me mad, though. They come in and they think... Right, well, you know, I, I, I'm still of the probably more old school mindset. You've got to earn your stripes when you come into a squad and you sort of, you know, do what you're told for the first couple of years. And and it's the ones that push back a little bit. And, you know, they probably get it a bit more, you know, get a bit more stiff from, from the uh, older players. But no, I don't think there's anything too bad from what I've known throughout the past. I mean, a couple of times there was one player... Um, when Sean Lamont told him to take, you know, you do these photo shoots at the beginning of the season and Sean Lamont said, uh, go and chuck that kit upstairs for the kit man. And he said, I'm not doing it. And this is Sean Lamont, 100 odd caps for Scotland. And everyone's just gone, hold on a minute, what's just happened? And you're like, oh shit, this isn't good. So Sean Lamont being the uh, the expert as he is, he just went, right, okay, then picked up all the kit himself put it all into the bin, took it all up. This man that played 100 caps for Scotland and said absolutely nothing about it, put it away. And it wasn't until the end of the season at the court session that it came back out. And that, that yeah, that player got his uh, come up and so certainly. So that was, that's how a, that's how a senior player should lead. So that was, um, that was probably the rugby, one time. Rugby, that's a great story. Like rugby has a way of, uh, of way of keeping him in place. Yeah. Uh, um, it has a brilliant way of keeping you in place. And yeah, court sessions are the perfect, perfect way to do that. It's such a shame. I haven't had a court session. It, what feels like eternity. Tell me about it. But it's just, you know, the way that Sean Lamont just, n- not a word was said, just picked it up and you, everyone knew, oh shit. And he, I think even the guy that had done it was like, oh, I should have taken that up. And you could tell. So it took a whole season to get him back. But yeah, he was, he was definitely uh, shamed for it. I'll say that. Did you hear what Eddie Jones came out with this week? So he said that he was embarrassed to be at the same table as the genius Sir David Brailsford, who transformed the British cycling team into the most successful in the world through his philosophical and psychological sporting theories. So I want to know what are the weirdest encounters you've had with specialist coaches or psychologists who've maybe been brought into camp to help the the team reach their true potential? I mean... I say weird psychologists uh, and performance coaches. I mean, one of the most amazing talks we were given, it was at a time, it was probably around 2011, 2012, maybe 2013. And I remember looking at England, social media was was kind of taken off and Twitter and all this. And England had, a, had got a few people in for um, to give the motivational talks. Uh, and I remember Gary Neville, had, I think he'd recently finished with England, um, or as a player with Man United, and he, he, he had gone into the England camp for a few days and, and given them big talks and Q&As and whatever. And um, I remember we sat as a, as a senior group with um, the team manager around, OK, who's Welsh that we can get in, you know, as a squad for doing the campaign? Who can we get in who's, you know, uh, maybe high performance um, or another sports person we can learn something off? And the team manager, team manager Alan Phillips, um, who's now the team manager of the Lions, was like, lads, leave it with me. And so a few weeks later, it's one Tuesday afternoon, um, post sorry, Tuesday evening, and we're all staying at the Vale Hotel. And Alan Phillips comes and introduces Howard Marks. Now, I don't know if you know who Howard Marks is. Howard Marks yeah. is Mr. Nice. So the film Mr. Nice, the famous book, how Mr. Nice is based on, basically he was the CIA's most wanted man at one point during Chuck the 80s. Um, yeah, he was the world's most notorious ganja dealer. Um, he Cardiff Uni, didn't he? No, he was at Oxford. <laughs> so he went to Oxford. If anyone hasn't seen the film Mr. Nice, Reese Evans plays him. Um, a wonderful book as well. Great, great story. Anyway, Howard Marks came to give us a talk. Nothing to do with sport. I mean, the lad, the lad, the bloke probably liked his rugby, um, but it was fascinating, absolutely oh, yeah. fascinating.